international organization is typically the managing body behind a set of systems, norms, rules, regulations, infrastructural elements, and or standards that sprawl across more than one government, which is why they're often also called intergovernmental organizations because they exist within and between the nations they span. The United Nations is a very large intergovernmental organization or maybe a collection of intergovernmental organizations that exist within a larger umbrella intergovernmental organization that manages all the smaller ones. And so are the European and African unions, the League of Arab States, the Commonwealth, the World Customs Organization, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, the Indian Ocean Commission, the International Solar Alliance, the New Development Bank, the Pacific Islands Forum, the International Committee of the Red Cross, the International Olympic Committee, and the Regional Center of Small Arms and Light Weapons in the Great Lakes Region, the Horn of Africa, and Bordering. So there are a lot of different groups that fit into this category and a lot of different focuses that each group specializes in, which is why they're developed and deployed in the first place. These groups are meant to allow governments to work together in various ways and to do so via means that aren't always possible or desirable using other mechanisms like alliances or treaties. International organizations can also allow government entities or external entities to contribute to causes while relinquishing some control over and responsibility for how those causes are tackled by providing resources and power to third-party entities that exist outside government control. This isn't always the case, as some organizations are pretty firmly in the pocket of one nation's government or another, but the idea is that this setup allows for the creation of another power loci, which operates in some ways like a government, without citizenry or territory, which can be a useful tool for solving certain problems and working together with other foreign entities on issues of shared concern. The first ever modern general international organization was the League of Nations, which was established in the aftermath of World War I with the stated purpose of maintaining world peace. Things went really sideways for a while there, and the global community was like, okay, if this happens again, if we have another war on that scale, and we have no reason to believe another conflict of that scale with that level of devastation won't happen again if things continue as they've always been, we might not come back from that. So we'll create this league, this international organization that will lash the world's governments together, provide them with a means of engaging with each other and solving problems in a non-military manner. And hopefully that, alongside negotiation and arbitration services provided by this organization, will allow nations to engage with each other peaceably more of the time. This concept proved to be solid but flawed, and the build-up toward and sparking of World War II was a testament to that. The United Nations was the successor to the League of Nations, and the concept was similar, to basically create a sort of legal fascia between the setups of individual governments, which would allow them to work with each other peaceably in the aftermath of World War II. But it also established a more concrete set of rules and norms that member states, but also to some degree the rest of the world, must adhere to, and mechanisms through which nations that don't adhere to these rules and norms could be punished by the involved nations. Giving an organization like this teeth was new, and though many have argued that the United Nations teeth aren't sufficient in the world we live in today, as nations run roughshod over them constantly, challenging and making the rules-based world order that has emerged in the wake of World War II more vulnerable as a consequence, this system and its many subsystems has seemed to help prevent some types of conflict and ameliorate some types of human rights issues and disasters globally even if imperfectly. The first ever infrastructural international organization, that is an organization that allows nations to work together to maintain some type of infrastructural element or elements, is called the Central Commission for Navigation on the Rhine, which is exactly what it sounds like, an organization focused on guaranteeing a high level of safety for vessels traveling the Rhine River and its surrounding area.
This organization was originally set up in 1815 by individual German states that straddled this regionally vital river at the time, but it still exists today. It's the oldest international organization of this kind and the oldest still operating international organization of any kind on the planet. And its modern incarnation is maintained by Belgium, France, Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. What I'd like to talk about today is the second oldest infrastructural international organization on the planet, the International Telecommunication Union, and how a scuffle within this organization may shape some fairly vital aspects of how we communicate and govern in the coming decades. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you're finding some value in what I'm doing here, consider becoming a supporter. One of the simplest ways to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. You can also become a member at understandery.com. But you can find a complete list of both monetary and non-monetary ways to support this show at letsknowthings.com slash support. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support this show, and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to start with today comes from Axios, and it's entitled, Another Potential Casualty of Ukraine War, Global Tech Standards. The International Telecommunication Union began its life as the International Telegraph Union back in mid-1865. At the time, telegraphs, systems for communicating over at times great distances, had evolved from primarily visual methods like flag-based semaphore and telegraph towers that could send messages from tower to tower using telescopes, flags, flames, and other such approaches. They'd evolved from that into electric telegraphs, which allowed folks at telegraph stations to send electrical pulses over cables that were strewn from station to station. These signals grew more complex and encoded, and this is how systems like Morse code developed, with dots and dashes, pulses and non-pulses along these electrical cables, representing letters and symbols, which in turn allowed for the rapid transmission of information across vast distances throughout this system. Proto-versions of electrical telegraph networks formed alongside early railroad tracks in Europe, which made signaling along these networks of tracks a lot easier and more reliable. Eventually, though, these networks expanded across vast swaths of land and ultimately into neighboring territories and even across oceans. The cables bundled up in various sorts of insulation so that the electrical transmission would be maintained even across those watery expanses though getting that insulation right took a while, and there were quite a few shark attacks aimed at these cables in the meantime. As these networks expanded, it became ever more important to figure out who would build what, who would maintain what, and how these stations, which were increasingly connected to other stations, not just in-country, but internationally as well, would deal with messages from across borders. And that's true in the sense that they needed to figure out which messages took precedent, but also what would be passed on to whom how these transmissions would be paid for, and which governmental entities would be responsible for maintaining which portions of these networks, which again included a whole lot of stations where the messages would be sent, received, and passed on to other stations, but also an ever-expanding jumble of electrical cable infrastructure between them across land and water, the latter of which was often considered to be free and open territory owned by no one. As part of this larger series of negotiations and implementation of rules and regulations that delineated how such networks would be funded and operated and maintained, conversations about what standards would be used in order to ensure all the stations were compatible with each other using the same codes and cables and electrical frequencies so that a new station being plugged into the network wouldn't short something out or send messages that were unintelligible took on increasing importance as this network 
like most networks of any kind, became more valuable the more nodes it had plugged into it. A telegraph network with just two stations is great in that it allows a message to be sent between these stations, but a network with hundreds of such stations massively increases the value of each individual station because of that increased range of operation. Thus, figuring out and implementing these standards across the board so that more and more stations could be added to the network was beneficial for everyone involved. It increased the communication range for everyone. Some of the early standards decided upon and enforced by the ITU was the use of Morse code as the International Telegraph Alphabet, mechanisms through which secrecy of correspondence could be, if not guaranteed, at least a lot more likely, and the right of everyone to use this system to send messages which was a fairly revolutionary concept at the time, and one that went on to inform the formation and baseline standards of another communications network, the Internet, over a century later. Another quite similar international organization, the International Radio Telegraph Union, was essentially the same thing as the ITU, but for radio telegraphy, which used radio waves instead of transmission cables to send telegraph messages and which was formed a little bit later than the ITU in 1906. And that organization eventually merged with the ITU in late 1932, and it was decided that this enlarged ITU organization would sort things out, come up with standards and rules and such for telegraphy, telephony, so telephones, and radio, three dominant communication mediums of that era. In late 1947, shortly after the United Nations was formed, the ITU was absorbed into that larger organization and became a UN agency tasked with continuing to do what they were already doing but on a larger scale than they had up till that point, handling all telecommunications of existing and future types. Today, the ITU has all UN member states, except the Republic of Palau, as members as a fairly complex bureaucracy, keeping things ticking along, including five different administrative regions, each with between 5 and 13 seats, adding up to 48 seats in total, which represent these different regions on the ITU Council, alongside a secretariat, which is led by a secretary general, who acts as the legal representative of this organization, while also being responsible for keeping things moving. This person is the head of the organization and is elected for a four-year term. That Axios piece, in part, is about a scuffle happening within the ITU and surrounding it as well, about who will become the secretary general of this organization next. The current Secretary General, Hu Lin Zhao, a representative from China, will finish up his second term as the Secretary General of the ITU in late 2022, at the next conference where they decide on all sorts of things related to the organization, but during which they also elect their Secretary General for the next four years. And that conference will be held in late September through mid-October 2022. And though this is not an organization or conference that ordinary people typically pay much attention to, there is a surprising amount of hubbub and drama in this space right now, to the point where things have gotten uncomfortable and weird because this upcoming election has two frontrunners. Doreen Bogdan Martin, who was notably the first woman to hold an elected office in the ITU ever, and she took office in 2018, which maybe tells you something about this organization, and Rashid Ismailov, who, like Bogdan Martin, is already in higher office within this organization. This is notable because Bogdan Martin is being supported by the U.S., while Ismailov is being supported by Russia. And after Russia invaded Ukraine at the tail end of February 2022, a majority of countries in the ITU voted to exclude Russians from elected leadership positions for standards-setting committees. So the groups within the ITU that decide on international standards for things are no longer able to have Russians elected to lead them following this decision. And that decision was made after Russia decided to invade Ukraine. This is especially tricky, though, because that decision does not apply to the upcoming election for ITU Secretary General, so Ismailov is still in the running, 
some analysts and governments are seeing this as a vital election then, because although it deals with often behind the scenes wiring and bureaucracy related to how the internet fits together and what tech is used for what and how things are managed on the global scale, it may also represent a potential victory for the Russian and Chinese governments' shared ambitions to gain more control over their own regional online tech stack, in part by making the global tech stack more favorable to the way they'd like things to be. China has long used a system of surveillance and censorship technologies and rules, often referred to as the Great Firewall, to keep Chinese people within its borders from seeing or sharing things they don't want them to see or share, while also ensuring the information they do want disseminated reaches pretty much everyone. Russia has in recent years been upending and rebuilding their local infrastructure in an attempt to do something similar. Other nations like Iran, Kazakhstan, and Turkey have done similar things, but the scale of Russia and the scale of its previous interconnection with the rest of the world via the internet has made this new upending especially overt and worrying. Their attempts to follow China's lead has basically raised alarm bells that we might see various types of autocratic nations around the world start to tear the interconnected mesh of the internet apart into pieces, often collectively referred to as the splinter net, which would allow these autocratic governments to have more control over their local permutation, their local splinter of the net, something the current Chinese ITU Secretary General has already pushed toward to a limited degree, and that in turn would improve their chances of successfully erecting their own great firewall. The move at the ITU, then, is thought to be related to this splinter net effort. If Russia can gain more control over this regulation and standards-setting body, it would be more capable of adjusting global standards to suit its ambitions, including, but not limited to, allowing them to replace the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, or ICANN, shifting that body's responsibilities and powers over to the ITU, which they would then control, and giving nations that want to splinter off their own piece of the global internet pie the ability to do so without facing serious punishments from the ITU or as many other internationally leveled downsides as they typically do today. The ITU is also responsible for setting standards related to basic internet protocols and new transmission technologies like the currently under deployment 5G wireless network. And these systems, likewise, would be more appealing to nations like Russia and China if they could remove some of the incentives and disincentives managed by the U.S. government and certain U.N. bodies so that independent national governments would have more power over their local splinter, giving autocratic leaders the ability to set up their own version of the Internet without as many negative consequences. And there are quite a few such consequences for taking one's country offline or doing things against the ITU's guidance and rules today. And just to make clear why this seemingly arcane organization is so important for these purposes, consider that part of why the United States became a global economic superpower is that it was able to set and enforce standards across just a silly number of industries during and post-World War II, because it was making stuff and shipping that stuff globally as part of normal trade with a bunch of nations that had been obliterated or reduced in scale during the conflict, and as part of efforts like the Marshall Plan, which saw the U.S. sending a whole lot of free stuff and money to many countries around the world to help them rebuild. There were humanitarian reasons for this, alongside alliance and friendship building rationales. But all of this production and scaling up also meant that the way the U.S. made and did things often became the de facto and eventually official standard for many of those things, from car engines to the screws used in furniture. Those who control the standards for anything, can often benefit, even if just in small ways, but at times in very large ways as well, even if the advantages granted aren't always obvious or flashy from the outside.
5G standards for telecommunications are already set, but there's a chance that powers granted by control of the ITU at this moment in time could allow for more wiggle room in how this communications network is deployed globally and could also allow for nation-favoring standards to be inserted within 6G, the next step standard that is in the process of being developed right now. There are universal benefits to having standards in place, even if they somewhat favor one nation or another, because of the economies of scale, which makes things cheaper as we produce more of those things, and because of that same network effect enjoyed by early telegraph networks. The more nodes you have in a network, and the more they can interoperate with each other, the more valuable each of those nodes become, the easier to repair, the more efficient, and so on. There are downsides to such standards as well, though, including a relative lack of diversity in these spaces that can then stifle innovation. When everyone's using the same Morse code and telegraph cables globally, there's little incentive to try out or invest in new types of cable and encoding languages, which means whatever's already there has a latent first-mover advantage over even far better versions of the same that come around later. Alternatives tend to be stymied, and we may then miss out on a lot of cool, useful new stuff that could have been great had that stuff not been killed off by these incumbent standards before they could develop. A lot of this current throwdown, though, is related to countries like China and Russia that want to have more control over their local version of such networks while continuing to profitably interact with the rest of the world in some way across them which is something that might be possible and potentially through some lenses at least, even widely beneficial because it could grant us the versatility to try out new things country by country while also having converters of a sort that allow different networks to connect to each other. A bit like the adapters we use when plugging in our electrical devices when traveling to another country that has a different electrical standard than we have back home. Now, anyone who's used such an adapter knows that it's kind of cumbersome and a pain to buy and carry such things around, but there's a chance adapter-like technologies and systems, including potentially new international organizations that allow differing country or region-specific meshes of online activity to engage with each other, could be profitable for everyone involved. Except, arguably, the people stuck living within severely limiting and even abusive versions of the internet. That said, existing dominant communication standards seem likely to stick around for at least a while longer, as building out localized versions of the same won't be affordable enough to be within the reach of many global autocrats for the foreseeable future. There's a chance... China, or at some point even Russia, might white-label their version of the Great Firewall to be used on another nation's networks, and they could then sell that service to their neighbors or anyone else who wants to have that kind of control over their own slice of the internet. Right now, that doesn't seem to be a thing, at least not on scale. And that's partly because of the incentives and disincentives baked into ITU-developed regulations and policies. So depending on how all this shakes out, we may see a new market develop in this space alongside new sets of standards, regulations, and potentially even international organizations to manage them. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter Folks who contribute to the show via Patreon at patreon.com slash let's know things and folks who contribute to all of my work at understandery.com gain access to an additional episode of the show each month. But you can find a complete list of ways to support this show, both monetary and non-monetary, at letsknowthings.com slash support. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support this show and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. The book I'd like to recommend today is called Patient Zero, A Curious History of the World's Worst Diseases by Lydia Kang and Nate Peterson. I found this book to be an excellent overview of earlier diseases in particular, 
Because the diseases that we face today, the ones that are dominating headlines, a lot of us already have a decent amount of information about, but being able to see that new information in context, in the context of historical pandemics, ongoing and otherwise, has been useful to me. And being able to compare and contrast and then also appreciate how far we've managed to come, despite the many flaws in our systems and technologies still, from those earlier periods. Now, if you'd like to get a similar broad overview, if any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of Patient Zero by Lydia Kang and Nate Peterson. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes and transcript for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find a jumble of my other projects, including other podcasts, at understandery.com. And feel free to reach out and say howdy on social media. I'm Colin Wright on Facebook and at Colin is my name on Instagram and Twitter and most of the other ones. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Thank you.